Welcome to the 2017 Iowa City Book Festival presented by the Iowa City UNESCO City of Literature. We would like to thank the sponsors who made this event possible. The City of Iowa City, the University of Iowa, the Iowa Arts Council, the Iowa City Coralville Convention and Visitors Bureau, Iowa Public Radio, and the Tuesday Agency. Uh, if you haven't discovered Merge, which is just down the street a little ways, uh, there's a book fair going on there, and you can shop with authors, art, artists, booksellers, and more. And they have complimentary coffee from Iowa, or local roaster, Wake Up Iowa City. The vast majority of book festival events are offered without charge, but they are not free. Your tax-deductible donation gives us the ability to offer programs like this festival. Please consider supporting the City of Literature by texting the word book to 319-774-7669 and the following link. And there are also nice little bookmarks over there. You should pick up one on the way out. But we are here uh, to hear from author John Lauk. Sounds good. And uh, John received his PhD in economic history from the University of Iowa, his law degree from the University of Minnesota, and his BA from the South Dakota State University. He is the author of several books, including American Agriculture and the, Prob and the Problem of Monopoly, The Political Economy of Grain Belt Farming, 1953 to 1980. His newest book is From Warm Center to Ragged Edge, The Erosion of Midwestern Regionalism, 1920 to 1965, from the University of Iowa Press. He is the immediate past president of the Midwestern History Association. Please welcome John Mott. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming out today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back in Iowa City. Uh, as was just mentioned, I left Iowa City after my PhD program in 1997. And uh, I wrote my dissertation um, here at the University of Iowa. It was in, I grew up on a farm in South Dakota, so I was very interested in this whole question of the survival of small family farms and what could be done in terms of antitrust and economic policy to make them more viable. And uh, that led to uh, my dissertation and that book uh, by the very um, unfortunate title. Uh, it's way too long. It's like 25 words or something. but. Uh, it is about this whole question of what's going to happen to the small family farm tradition. And uh, the second, no, Ellis was on my committee. I was going to say he was a uh, second reader, but that's not true. But uh, Ellis Hawley was a uh, longtime professor of history here at the University of Iowa, was director of my master's thesis, but then served on my dissertation committee. and. My number two reader was Colin Gordon, uh, who some of you probably know. Um, got to catch up with Colin last night. Um, the director of my dissertation caused a lot of headlines when I was here in Iowa City, Deirdre McCloskey. You may remember this. This was a long time ago, uh, early 1990s, so um, having sex changes was not normal news back then, and, and uh, that, that was part of my experience when I came in. The, master's uh, paperwork was signed by Donald McCloskey and my uh, dissertation paperwork was signed by Deirdre McCloskey. So <laughs> it was a very interesting experience. Obviously Deirdre has gone on to do lots of uh, very important things and uh, has this multi-volume history of bourgeois virtue uh, that has been published by University of Chicago Press, which if you haven't seen is, uh, is something uh, to check out. So. Very nice to be back in Iowa City. Uh, left a long time ago. I can't believe it was 20 years. Um, but some of the ideas um, that just uh, that came out in this book that was just published a few months ago uh, began to percolate here in Iowa City back in those days. Uh, we used to have a little uh, informal reading club that would meet down at the Dublin Underground on Friday afternoons, and we'd talk about all the important problems of the world and our various seminars and uh, things that we should be focusing on in our research and uh, often the subject uh, of the Midwest and 
whether or not it was getting enough attention and historiography uh, would come up. And um, many years went by, and we actually started to do to take some steps to uh, remedy this issue. Um, so I'd just like to say a few words about the book today, and then I will uh, say a little bit about the Midwestern History Association and then set you free. I know it's Friday afternoon, and I'm the only person standing between you and cocktail hour, uh, which is a very dangerous place to be, so. Um. Saturday, <laughs> That's true, it is Saturday, so. Maybe people have already started. Uh, but I wanted to start with something I heard this morning uh, at an earlier panel. There was a session this morning about place and setting in writing that I thought was very interesting. And there was a woman who spoke this morning. Uh, her name is Ann Kennedy. Uh, leave it to the Kennedys to impart some wisdom here to these proceedings. Um, but Ann Kennedy's from. Um, from New Zealand, and she was talking about her work on uh, the history of New Zealand and literature in New Zealand, and she was making the point that um, she just decided one day uh, as a young woman in New Zealand that their culture was so heavily derivative of uh, things done in London and the UK, and she wondered what indigenous writing and local writing and regional writing in New Zealand was like. And so she started this quest to uh, rediscover the literary tradition in New Zealand. And um, she said she began to discover these uh, unknown, forgotten writers in New Zealand that actually wrote about her home place, uh, about her uh, home country. And uh, they didn't do, th do so from the perspective of, of England. And um, she wanted, as she said, uh, to overcome what she felt was the erasure of place, uh, her place and uh, her story and uh, where she grew up in New, New Zealand. And that has very direct parallels with what I'm trying to do in this new book. Um, and that is to reestablish or rediscover or excavate this old tradition of Midwestern regionalist writing that is, uh, if you pull back the curtain, a fairly strong tradition. And uh, unfortunately, it's kind of faded. It's uh, not considered fashionable to write about. Um, but that's, uh, that's my goal with this book, is to rediscover it. Uh, the title, uh, From Warm Center to Ragged Edge, we have a lot of literature people here in the audience today. Does anybody know where that comes from? Um, that phrase comes from uh, Fitzgerald, a uh, Midwestern writer, St. Paul uh, native. Uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald um, left St. Paul in, uh, I don't know, he, he was 18 or 19 or so. But he, in a way, um, put part of his story into the famous story of Nick Carraway and the Great Gatsby. If you remember, Carraway goes away to war and uh, he's trying to decide what to do after World War I and he decides to uh, move to Long Island and be part of the, uh, of the Roaring Twenties in New York because as he saw it, uh, his old Minnesota home was kind of boring. As he said, it was the ragged edge of the universe. And by the end of the story, you know all the various twists and turns, he begins to see his old Minnesota home as uh, the warm center of the world, as Fitzgerald says. So that's where the title comes from. And Fitzgerald figures uh, uh, in a major way in the book in this sense. Um, there was, for many years, a very popular uh, literary um, summary of, of what intellectuals and writers uh, from the Midwest uh, were doing in the 1920s and 1930s. And um, as, as it was described, they were revolting from the village. And uh, for many years, I taught it this way in my classes, uh, that these writers, such as uh, Fitzgerald and Sinclair Lewis from uh, Minnesota, um, Edgar Lee Masters from across the border here in central Illinois, 
um, Sherwood Anderson in Ohio, the, the popular interpretation was they were in their works, in their novels, uh, they were mocking and criticizing uh, the Midwest for being backward and retrograde um, and a stifling place. And I taught it that way. I didn't, uh, I saw this reference many times in historical literature, but a few years ago, I just decided to probe that uh, interpretation a little bit deeper. And as it turns out, that, that that is not a fair way to describe what they were doing. In fact, uh, many of them were, wrote many um, complimentary things, for lack of a better word, about the Midwest, and they did not want their legacy to be um, that they attacked the region. And so this idea of the revolt from the village is simply not true, but it just stood in place, uh, remained in place as the dominant interpretation for many decades. And uh, one of the things I want this book to do is to uh, undermine that old interpretation and overturn it. And um, I, I go through in the book many examples of why this interpretation is wrong, but I think the, the, um, the most persuasive evidence on this score is that each one of these individuals very specifically said toward the end of their life, this is untrue. I never meant to be a part of a, of a revolt from the village. I did not mean to attack the Midwest. This is a made-up theory by an English professor from Columbia, and please stop saying that. Um, so I think, I think the case should be closed, at least in my view, but we'll see. Uh, actually, I was on a, um, on a panel at the Society for the Study of Midwestern Literature, uh, a couple months ago, and someone there was making the case for reviving the revolt from the village interpretation. So who knows? We'll, this debate may go on for a while. Uh, we'll see. Um, second thing I do in this book is I try to get us thinking again about an older tradition of writing, of literary regionalism that was prominent in this region. And I point to, since we're in Iowa City, I'll just highlight a few uh, Iowa examples. I point to some of these um, people who were um, active in creating a network of writers focused on the Midwest. Um, I think the best example for us today is uh, John T. Frederick, who was a, uh, grew up on a farm in Iowa. And he moved, and he came over here to the University of Iowa probably about 1905, maybe 1910, somewhere in there. And he got connected to the, uh, the dean of uh, the College of Arts and Science, who had recently invited in um, a speaker, uh, Harvard philosopher Josiah Royce, who gave a major talk, uh, major address um, at the Iowa Union about promoting a higher provincialism, as he called it, uh, which was his term for regionalism, or encouraging uh, Iowans um, to understand their roots and their heritage better and to write about their own region and stay here and stay close to home and don't run off to Manhattan to be closer to the publishing houses, which is always a constant tension um, among budding writers about where, where should they go, where should they stay, what is the best way to, uh, to get their books published. But John T. Frederick uh, really took this up. Uh, he ultimately earned his PhD in uh, English, and he started a journal called The Midland here in Iowa City. And it was uh, one of these major journals of the regionalist wave of the uh, 20s and 30s. Uh, this all kind of fizzled out after World War II, but that in those, during those interwar years, this was a very active uh, and going concern. Uh, this is also where the Iowa Writers Workshop comes out of. This same impulse is what gave the workshop its energy and its, uh, and its early rationale for its existence. I mean, its, its um, mission has evolved and changed since then, but it, it has its roots in this regionalist movement uh, that I talk about in the book. 
Some of the other writers that you may have heard of, uh, this is a very sophisticated literary crowd, so you may have heard of these people, but not, not many people have. Um, Jay Sigmund uh, from Cedar Rapids uh, was a poet, uh, w lived in the Wapsipinicon Valley, uh, wrote uh, several books, several novels about that area. Beautiful stuff, but not remembered well at all. Ruth Suko uh, from Haywarden, Iowa is another example of this. And she, uh, and she was, you know, uh, very well known in her day. And um, I try to, I ask people to, uh, to delve into some of her older novels, which are very good and they're very Cather-esque, I would say but she's not remembered uh, in the same way that Cather is. There's, gonna, there's a major biography in the works um, of, of um, Ruth Suko, so maybe more people will remember her in coming years. Anyway, I think, uh, I think there's lots more to be done on this. Um, I think there's lots uh, more people to be rediscovered as part of this process. I know some of you were there this morning at Prairie Lights when, when the young man was talking about how he discovered these forgotten novels and forgotten writings of Walt Whitman. I mean, it was a wonderful story. These were books that uh, nobody knew existed until he followed a few clues, a few leads, and uh, lo and behold, he found a forgotten novel by Walt Whitman. But I think there's a lot of that kind of work to do on this old Midwestern literary tradition. Um, this would make a great dissertation, Steve, if you got a young, ambitious uh, history student to, to delve into this. And this is the perfect place to do it because the University of Iowa Archives has a lot of these collections, including Suko's collection, including the Writer's Workshop collection. Um, and I think they could follow the leads through all the letters and what the network was and come up and, and, um, and talk about some people that probably haven't been talked about in 50 years. Uh, another person's Wallace Stegner. And people forget, people always think of Stegner as a Westerner and Stanford and he writes about California, but he's from Iowa. He's from Lake Mills, uh, Iowa. And he got his PhD at the University of Iowa. And he spent all his time in, in the 30s and 40s in Iowa City hobnobbing with what some of these regionalist writers. So lots of work to be done. Um, another chapter in this book uh, has to do with what happened to the old field of Midwestern history, which once was a very prominent field. Um, in the early 20th century, several historians and leaders of Midwestern historical societies gathered in Lincoln Nebraska, and they formed the Mississippi Valley Historical Association, which was designed to focus on this region. And this uh, organization lasted until the 1960s, in which there was a vote, mostly by non-Midwesterners, to change its mission and title to the uh, Organization of American Historians and make it a national history uh, organization, which obviously the OAH is a very prominent organization. It's it's wonderful, it's done a lot of great things, but it lost its regional roots and nothing uh, was built to replace it. Um, so while there was a very active Western History Association, a very big Southern Historical Association, New England, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a historical society and very active um, history group there. Uh, the Midwest had no such, um, had no such organization um, for many, many decades. And so the field went into steep decline. Uh, people stopped teaching uh, the history of the Midwest. There are fewer and fewer books about the Midwest. Um, but I'm here to report that uh, there's some good news on that front. Uh, over the past few years, uh, there's been a group that's tried to revive interest in the region. A Midwestern History Association was formed in 2014 um, after, um, 
after a round of beers in a Wisconsin bar, uh, it was decided to form a new organization, and uh, it's it's taken off. And uh, we've gotten some support. The University of Iowa Press launched a new series, um, Iowa in the Midwest, the history of Iowa in the Midwest, which is uh, which this book comes out of. Also, in 2013, I published this book by University of Iowa Press called The Lost Region, trying to explain how the Midwest, uh, you know, lost its place in, in historiography. Um, but again, all those come out of the University of Iowa Press series about the Midwest. Um, in the last year or so, some other university presses have announced they want to get on the bandwagon. So... Uh, Notre Dame University Press is going to announce a series on Midwestern history. Um, Indiana University Press, which allowed their series to, uh, to um, fizzle out, uh, is reviving, um, revive, or actually starting a new series. And I'm forgetting someone else who just decided to do this. Um, but one other one I will mention is uh, um, and this is a great example of what we need to happen more often. There's a young woman from Decatur, Illinois, uh, got her PhD in English and now teaches at Hastings College in Nebraska. She just went into her administration at the college and said, we need more books about this region. I want to start Hastings College Press. And so she did. And um, she asked me to head up a series, Rediscovering the Midwest series. And the first book in that series uh, came out. Well, it will be coming out. This is like an advanced copy. Um, if you're really into it, uh, let me know. I'll give you this copy. Um, but I should say this is also dedicated to Ellis Hawley. He's a Kansan. He's a Midwesterner. So helped me a lot back in the day, so I was happy to give Ellis the dedication. The book is entitled The Midwestern Moment, The Forgotten World of Early 20th Century Midwestern Regionalism. And uh, much like the chapter in this book that tries to put some of these older writers on the map, um, we try to do that in this book. Um, we have chapters about Booth Tarkington, um, Beth Streeter Aldrich, um, there's a guy named Walt Mason who was very prominent back in the day. No one remembered him. Um, uh, but anyway, I highly recommend it to you. Uh, but again, I think that's a very solid sign of, uh, of progress for getting this region uh, back, on, back on the map. Okay, I'm going to say one last thing. I can't believe this is a uh, half hour has already gone by, but then we'll open it up for your for you to ask any questions you might have. Uh, but the last thing, if you're gonna have the revival of an academic field, I think the most crucial thing is probably having a journal. And in 2014, I think it was, uh, we launched the new um, Middle West Review. University of Nebraska Press publishes it. And every month we have probably three or four articles and. 25 or so book reviews. Um, so this is a good way for people to track what's going on in the field and the new books in the field. Um, this is the brand new issue. I only have one copy. I brought the press, University of Nebraska Press, mailed a bunch of copies of the last issue to my hotel. So I have some copies I'd like to share with you if you want one. Uh, I only have one of these, though, but this is the brand new issue. Um, but I'm very excited about that because we have a symposium in here on um, regional studies. Um, we have 10 different essays uh, from people. I asked them, I'm one of the editors on this journal. I asked uh, people to reflect on the region that they write about and tell us what it can tell us about the Midwest and Midwestern studies. So we have people weighing in uh, on the South, the West, New England, Alaska. There's Arctic studies is a, uh, is a academic field, which would be very fun. I wish I was involved in that. Uh, South, Sun Belt, Great Plains, Mid-Atlantic, Pacific Northwest, et cetera, et cetera. So those are very fun to read. I know if you have an interest in regional studies, 
um, you'll want to you'll want to take a look at that. So with that, uh, I don't want to go on any more. Um, it is Saturday night at 4:30, so I'd love to hear from you. Uh, do you have any questions about this book or the projects we have ongoing, and and you want to get involved and help the cause? Do you have concerns? Do you want it to grow? You think it's a mistake? You tell me. Hi. I, um, so my question is, uh, what are you hoping comes out of this debate that you're hoping to start? Uh, when you're looking at these kind of historical over uh, courses that, that take on uh, all of American literature or a century at a time, and we get those assignments for the 1920s, are, are, do you want to see Ruth Suckow replace uh, Sherwood Anderson or Sinclair Lewis, or do you just want to see her read alongside them? Uh, I think the latter, um, and I think people need to read Sherwood Anderson in a different light because the way they have been reading Sherwood Anderson is, oh, here's the dark and brooding Sherwood Anderson of Winesburg, Ohio, and his whole mission in life is to attack the Midwest. That's not true at all. Uh, you need to consider the full corpus of his work and and his statements about what he intended with his work. Um, but I think uh, probably a lot of these surveys are starting to drop some of these people entirely. They may not even mention Sherwood Anderson in a negative light or positive light. Um, in more, um, just to be a little bit more um, ambitious about it, I think one thing we, we should strive for and um, uh, one of our goals should be to try and set up at least a few uh, professorships in Midwestern history at places like Iowa or Michigan or Minnesota or whatever so that if there are young graduate students who want to study the region they know where to go there's a couple professors there that can help them and guide them and be doctoral advisors and also um, pie in the sky we need some rich person to write a check to launch a Center for Midwestern Studies that will fund fellowships and uh, we'll fund research on the region, publish some books, um, and have some full-time staff to keep the field going. I mean, what we've done, I think, is pretty good, but uh, we're all doing it as a second job um, and getting, not getting paid for it. And as a result, you can't do as much as you could if you had uh, professional staff and, um, you know, people wear thin after a while. And, and uh, it would be nice to have a center helping with some of this. Um, I think most of us know that the small family farm isn't coming back. And I think a lot of these regional authors from before, you know, they were trying to get out of this. I mean, there was this idealization that just wasn't there. You know, I, I know a lot of people from small farms and they could hardly wait to get out, you know, because of the drudgery and all the chores and they felt like, you know, God, when can, when's the first opportunity I can get out of here and go to college or anything else but that. And do you really think that the small family farm has, can have a comeback? No, but I mean, I'm, I'm approaching this from a historical angle in the sense of, you know, there is this big chunk of our history. This did happen, and we need to kind of know the record. Um, can we revive the old family farm tradition of 1925? No, I don't think so. But I think if we're going to fully understand our uh, literary and intellectual history, uh, all of this needs to be a part of it. And so... I wish I had some nice policy goals to squeeze out of this uh, literary analysis that would help the family farm, but uh, I actually did some of that in my first book uh, that I worked with uh, Ellis on and did some, made some proposals at the end of that book in terms of tweaking antitrust policy and making economic conditions a little more favorable for family farmers. So if you really want to get into that, 
it's kind of deep, not pleasant reading sometimes, but uh, you can check that out. You, you talk a lot about the, uh, the coasts and what's fashionable and so forth, uh, but one of my concerns as a Midwesterner is sort of the southernization of America or the NASCARization. Do you see your work as kind of a bulwark uh, against, against that? Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I think you've mentioned this in some of your other writings. Dave McMahon in the back row has uh, talked about um, this odd tendency among some Midwesterners to kind of embrace, I don't know, flying the Confederate flag in the backyard or whatever. And I think there was a Des Moines Register article about this, I think. Um, but I see that as um, a symptom of people not knowing their own regional heritage and history. I mean, it's a very odd thing for an Iowa person to fly the Confederate flag. It's, um, it makes no sense as a historical matter. Um, Iowa was one of the most uh, active and prominent states in supplying troops to the Union and was one of the states where anti-Southern attitudes were the strongest um, and was one of the most Republican states in the Union. And back then, Republican meant being anti-Southern. Um, I have a quote in here from Ruth Succo, which um, Jeff asked about. And uh, it's interesting, she went to the South one time in the 20s or 30s, and she came back sort of shocked about what life was like there. And she's like, this is not what it's like in Haywarden, Iowa. That is a foreign country. It's a different place. And the one thing that she thought was so appalling is that whites in the South, this is her analysis again in the 1920s, had no work ethic. She said farmers here around Haywarden, they take great pride in working hard. In the South, it's seen as, uh, as a burden or a humiliation to have to work hard. And then she went into this analysis of uh, race relations in the South and et cetera. So yeah, I think uh, if people understood Midwestern regional history better, uh, they would be less susceptible to this kind of odd embrace of Southern icons. But one of the problems we have in the Midwest is people don't know their history very well. Uh, I know that your, your book is about um, literature, and so I'm straying a bit from the topic. But as you were speaking, I was thinking a lot about Grant Wood and um, how reviled he was by his own faculty here at Iowa for embracing regionalism. Um, and you know the charge that he experienced that it, it was basically proto-fascist, uh, this provincialism, um, as it was called. And and I wonder if you see or anticipate risks um, in the revival of Midwestern history along those lines. And perhaps it's analogous to um, the person in the back's question. You know that that uh, the way it's framed. Um, can sometimes be exclusive, particularly toward people of color, for example. And so um, is there a chance or an, an opportunity for the left um, to do damage to this noble effort of yours? Uh, I, think, um, I think that's always a risk, but I think that um, if the history is explained um, well, if people understand um, the nature of this regionalism, um, then, then we shouldn't be subject to attack. But there is this fear among many intellectuals, very legitimate fear, uh, that when you sort of stoke this idea of heritage politics, it may have dark consequences. But that's really not what this is. I mean, this is like knowing Grant Wood, getting to know Jay Sigmund, the poet from Cedar Rapids, rereading the old novels of, uh, of Ruth Succo, understanding F. Scott Fitzgerald in a new way, maybe contributing to new journals, maybe participating in uh, you know, new regional ventures, like maybe we could do a magazine about the region, et cetera. It's all pretty innocent to me. I mean, I think you could make it and you could give it some 
uh, darker. Um, I mean, you could, I think, stoke some fears about it, but I don't think those would be legitimate. Those writers were also responding to kind of a, a big change in the American identity, that the 1920 census came back and, and discovered that more people lived in cities than lived out in rural areas for the first time in the country's history. To some degree, that, that discussion of a revolt from the village is trying to come to terms with who we are as a country and uh, how we define that. Um, I guess if you take away the revolt from the village framework on that, what do you replace it with for trying to get at the, the kind of big shock in the nation as they recognize that they were now an urban nation as opposed to a rural nation? Well, I think you could uh, frame it this way. You could say, um, you know, there is this coming of modernity, uh, growing urbanization, um, major changes in the country caused by industrialization, et cetera. And one of the responses to it uh, was this idea of promoting or embracing regionalism. And, and you could um, frame it that way instead of making it seem like it's this, um, it's this negative thing. That's how I would do it if I'm going to rewrite my course syllabus or lectures. There's a great book, by the way, uh, that unfortunately doesn't get much attention, and it kind of frames it this way, called The Revolt of the Provinces by Robert Dorman, uh, which is a study of regionalism. He, got a, he received his PhD from Brown University, and uh, there was an expert at Brown on regionalism that he worked with um, to write that book. It's a, it's a wonderful book, but he's a very humble, shy guy, and he doesn't really promote the book that much, but that would be a much better way to frame it. And his chapter on the Midwest is good, but it's not very deep. Um, I think this book goes into a lot more detail and leaves a lot of breadcrumbs there for future graduate students of Steve to follow and write books down the road. Anybody else? Does anybody want a copy of not the most recent issue of Middle West Review, but the spring issue. Yes, spring 2017. If you do, please come up and, uh, and take one. And thank you for coming. <laughs>